He walked along the shores of Galilee. From clay He formed the healing balm that caused the blind to see. When stones of wrath lay heavy in their hands, He knelt to write His mercy in the sand. Jesus came to set the captives free. Showed us by the way he lived, the way we need to be. Our love is more than words could ever say. We must touch them with compassion to help them find their way. How can we reach a world we never taught? Can we show them Christ if we never show them love? Just to say we care will never be enough. How can we reach a world we never touch? Could we be so busy being saved? Trying to impress a world that's long since lost its way. We pride ourselves in being set apart. Yet we don't take time to touch our broken heart. Even if we found the time to care, would we take the risk involved in always being there? Oh, we hold the very thing they need so much. Sometimes a word of love can pass through just a simple touch. How can we reach a world we never touch? How can we show them Christ if we never show them love? Just to say we care will never be enough. How can we reach a world we never touched? We hide behind these walls and the security of friends. While beyond the stained glass windows, the world is lost in sin. How can we reach a world we never touched? How can we show them Christ if we never show them love? Just to say we care will never be enough. How can we reach a world we never touched? How can we reach a world we Touch. Ooh, so true. You know, we, we tend to walk around with our face planted in privacy, right? On our phones, ignoring everybody that walks up and down around us. And uh, what we need to do is look up because those fields are wide unto harvest. And uh, that's what the Lord told us many, many years ago, and I believe it's even wider now, and it's even closer now to harvest than it ever has been. So, Brother Jackson is going to come preach for us this morning, and uh, you come on, Brother Jimmy. You know, there's a lot of things I like about Brother Jimmy. Um, he, he preaches okay. Uh, he, he's, got a, he's got a beautiful family, and he's got an awesome... Uh, his wife picks out some really, really nice ties. I hey, told him this morning, only real men can wear flowery ties. Um, the rest of us wear other things, but no. <laughs> Amen, brother. Appreciate you. Come Amen. preach for us, all right? Amen. Judges chapter 7. Whew. Judges chapter 7. If you heard our ministry presentation, what you missed was uh, was we put our ministry presentation video together, and I didn't... I didn't know there was right channel, left channel, center channel, back channel, anyway, with audio, and 
And so you missed our background music, but they sang it. That's our that's our ministry song. Judges chapter seven. How how can we reach a, a world we never touch? Listen, I, I am I am all for being loving and caring, and I, I'm all for all those things. I, I'm I'm for loving on a sinner. Listen, I, I'm I'm for walking up to a harlot who's out drawing water all by herself because nobody else loves her. This isn't even in the message, and I'm a manuscript preacher, so I'm off reservation this morning. Uh, thanks, choir. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm all for that, but I, I'm, I'm for loving on somebody so that it gives me influence. You hear me? I, I want to give them water in Jesus' name, but I want to give them Jesus' name, right? I, I don't, I don't want to just do good, right? Because if I just do good and send them on their way, I've lost everything. Like, why do I feed the homeless? Why well, I, 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 I try to feed the homeless so that I can give them Jesus. Why, do I, why, why am I nice? Why am I good? Why am I all these things? Why do I work on having a clean testimony? So that I can give somebody Jesus' name. All right, Judges chapter 7. Whew. All right. Well, I'm not going to hide my intent this morning. My, my intent this morning is, is to preach Jesus as often as I can. And, and I like it in, uh, in John 12. You don't have to flip there. But the Greeks, they, if you know what's going on in John chapter 12, there's this whole religious gathering. And these guys just break into the middle of it. Right? I, I love those guys. They just walk into this thing. It would be like somebody coming around a corner and, and we're having this religious gathering and let's just say that, that uh, Heartland is just, just, you know, we're not having church. Let's say we're just doing something else religiously, but we're not diving into God's word and asking the Holy Spirit to, to work in our lives. And this guy comes in and he goes, okay, I don't know what is going on here, but sirs, we would see Jesus, right? I, I, I'd love those distractions. I, I would love it if somebody says, okay, okay, okay. Like, I get the religi religiosity of what's going on here, but I want to see Jesus this morning. I, I need help, right? That's what I want to get to this morning. And you say, well, how is that going to help us? This is, this is missions conference. Well, <laughs> something I want to challenge you to do is missions. You, you invited a church planner, by the way. <laughs> But you see what, uh, if, you, if you miss everything, if, you, if you're keyed in on the food back there, by the way, I cut out an hour's worth of this message because I smelled the food. <laughs> you're like, you did what? Yeah, so we're only going to go for one hour instead of two. Uh, but if you miss everything, if you go to sleep, if you, if you just like miss this, don't, don't miss this. Listen, I, I found this in discipleship. When somebody gets saved, when they trust Christ as their Savior, when they, when they repent of their sinfulness and, and they trust Jesus Christ to be their Savior, their way to heaven, their payment for their sin, this crazy thing happens. Okay? When, when you come to Christ, this isn't even in it here, when you come to Christ, you're, a, you're born again, you're a new babe in Christ. And then as you start to disciple, as you start to grow in that grace, as you, as you start to, to learn from people who've learned before you, and you start digging into this Bible, this crazy thing happens. And I've seen it every single time, preacher. As, as you study and you get closer to the Lord and you start realizing what your salvation cost, this crazy thing happens, and I see it almost every single time in discipleship. They see the holiness and righteousness of God, and they start becoming more and more and more aware of their failings. The closer you see, the closer you get to God's holiness, the more you realize just how vile you are, and this weird thing happens. Either, either they settle that, and they just step on and they keep walking, or they go, hmm, and they just shirk back, and their discipleship stops. So there's so many people that I know that are right at this threshold. They, there's this line drawn where they say, I'm a failure, and they draw this line, and they stop, and their discipleship's stunted. And then there's some that I see that, that they cling to God's word, and they learn some things, and they press on. And that's what I want to deal with. I, I, I'm looking now at a church, and I believe that, that you're sold out. I, 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 yesterday, I was encouraged, preacher, to see everybody going out, and but if I could just be real and assume for a second, I, I want to say that, that there's a church full of people who, who have started walking toward and, and, and this, this growth and discipleship, but I believe that you're all standing and waiting at a place and your discipleship is stunted because you've come face to face with the holiness of God and something has slowed you down. So the title of my message this morning, and I loved it because the sound booth goes, you sure you want to use this as your title? And I was like, it's bad, isn't it? And he walks away and he goes, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I love it. I love honesty. Just, just tell me how it is, okay? 
Recipe for Failure. If you like a title, it's called A Recipe for Failure. You see, what I love about Jesus Christ is that he knows me. You're like, okay, that's not really. He knows me and he loves me. But chew on that. The reason you might like me is because you see a facade. Like, you didn't, you didn't smell my breath when I woke up this morning because I'm a mouth breather when I sleep. You know what my breath smells like in the morning? It smells like death. That <laughs> smells like death. You know what? I covered that up. I think I brushed like twice this morning. You don't know me. You're like, oh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Wait, you're making me kind of uncomfortable. You don't know me. You know what? My wife dresses me. Like, she doesn't dress me, but she buys the stuff I put on. What you like about me is because of what I've done to myself. What I like about you is what you've done to yourself. Listen, when you wake up in the morning and you're kind of cranky, you know what? I probably don't like that. You know what you do? You know what I do? I eat food. <laughs> it makes me happy. And then you like that. You don't know me, and I don't know you. Jesus Christ knows us, and he loves us. By the way, if you're cranky, keep it to yourself. Like, Jesus might love you and all your cranky. I'm not. I'm not. Okay? So just keep that to yourself. Jesus Christ knows us and he loves us. That is wild. If you get nothing else from me, Jesus Christ fully loves you. He fully loves you completely. He chases after you. When you don't love him, he loves you. When you would cuss him, he still loves you. Huh. And sir, we would see Jesus. He's going to help us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I... I pray that you would help me this morning. Lord, I'm, I'm not the guy to preach this. But I'm so, I'm so amazed that you're such a good Savior. Lord, help the words of this book to come alive. It is a living book, but God, it's a spiritual book. And Lord, you could, you could close it right in front of us or you could open it. And you could help us to see it and understand it. And God, take it to our, ourselves. And, and Lord, those that might be lost. Lord, you're chasing hard after them. Lord, help them to see Jesus Christ, to be born again today. Those that are disciples waiting to really jump into the fight, God, help them to just take this truth to heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're in Judges chapter 7, and in our first text this morning, we're going to see Gideon, the fifth judge of the nation of Israel, and, and he is chosen by God to deliver the people of Mid from the nation of Midian. They've been captured and enslaved for seven years by this point. Gideon was nothing special, but in our text, we're going to find this. Here's our setup. We're going to find a 32,000-man army assembling to revolt against Midian, right? So we have 32,000 fighting for their independence. And we're going to pick it up in verse 2. So Judges chapter 7, verse 2. Read along with me. And we're going to go down to verse 8. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whom I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself, and likewise every one that boweth down unto his knees to drink. Verse 6, And the number of them that lappeth, putting their hands to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down unto their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lappeth will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man into his place. So the people took victuals in their hands and their trumpets, and they sent them, sent all of the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those three hundred men and the host of Midian were, was beneath him in the valley. You may sit. 32,000 people. 32,000 to 300. 
As a bus director in the Pensacola, Florida area, I had the privilege of working with a highly decorated Marine uh, fighter pilot, tactician, Major Robert Keene. Can you imagine him and I having this con conversation about battlefield strategy? 15,000 enemy troops to our 32,000. We got this, says the Major. Someone interrupts. Uh, excuse me, sir, God had other, other plans. He's sending 22,000 of them home. Can you imagine the look on this Marine's face? Before we get to the battlefield, 70% of his fighting force is gone. Hmm. He mutters something about improvise, adapt, and overcome. Hurrah, you know. And he changes his strategy. Now it's 15,000 to R10. It's tough, but it's doable. They don't know this is coming. We got an element of surprise, 15,000 to 10. Uh, excuse me, sir, God has, has other plans. He sent us all down to the river, and, and all the men that drank like dogs, we get to fight with those, but the others, God sent them to the house. Can you, can you imagine the look on this Marine's face now? Probably gritting his teeth. How many dogs do we have to fight with? Uh, huh. Sir, sir, we have, we have 300. We have, we have 300 dogs to fight with. <laughs> Marine just stands up and he just throws his hands up in the air and he walks out. 15,000 versus 300. That is 50 to 1. There's no way. There's no way. He just walks out. This is a recipe for failure. There's no way there can be victory here. Church, do you, do you agree with me there? God set this up, did he not? They came in their strength. And listen, he didn't send those people home with shame. Hey, hey, you just head on. You just head on. Hey, hey, you just, you just head on. You just, no shame so far. No failure so far. No sinfulness so far. God's doing this. You're like, this doesn't make sense. If you read your Bible wisely, listen, you'll see that God often inserts the lesson into the text if you'll pay attention to the context. Like, read the story. If you don't understand it, go back a couple verses. If you don't understand that, go back a couple chapters. Reread it. Read it again. Who is he talking to? Has he ever talked like that before? See, the, the, the key that opens the lock in Judges 7 is in verse 2. Let's read it again together. Verse 2. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Why? Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. I did it myself. God took all Gideon's strength away so that only God could get the glory. God said, I'm going to save you. Church, so many of us are in that place where we say, okay, well, I'll muster up enough strength to, and you're not getting the lesson. God said, your own hand can't save you. And to prove it, I'm going to strip your strength away. You can't win. Without a recipe for failure this morning, church, you and I cannot create what needs to be created. There must be failure. You're like, well, I don't like failure. Neither do I. <laughs> Deputation is dreadful for a personality like mine because I'm self-sufficient, I'm self-supported, I'm self-this, I'm self-that, I can do it myself. And God goes, no, you, no, you can't. In fact, I'm going to hinder you from doing it yourself. You and I should be more comfortable crying out. Listen, with, with, there was a man in Mark 9, verse 24. He said, Lord, I believe. Like, that's what we would love for our Christianity to be. We would love to say, Lord, I believe. Look at all my amazingness. But then he says this last half of the, of the verse. And listen, this should be a regular in our lips, in our, uh, on our tongue. Mark 9, 24 says, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. You say, well, a brother or sister in Christ come to you, and they say, I'm struggling with this doubt. You and I should wrap our arms around them and say, you know what? There's some struggles I got as my own. But Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, help me where I'm failing. you. Help me where there's holes. Let's leave acting to the actors. You know what this world needs? It doesn't need any more entertainers. It doesn't need any more social media people. They have their realm. I'm not going to step into their realm. Like some of that stuff might be entertaining, whatever. But that's entertainment, and they're fake. You know what this world needs? This world needs real. Well, I'm struggling with depression. Great. Find a lady in the church or find a man if you're a man in the church. Say, hey, I'm struggling with this thing. 
and be real and get some help. Boy, the Christian world doesn't need any more actors. You know what they need? They need real. Lord, I believe. Oh, help my unbelief. I'm struggling with this. So how can I apply an Old Testament truth to a New Testament truth? Because I believe, listen, you need to see the patterns in the Old Testament. Boy, Genesis, Genesis there to Malachi. You need those patterns. You need to see how God has operated in the past because he hasn't changed. You say, well, salvation was different in the Old Testament. No, it wasn't. Look at Abraham. Well, how was he saved? He was saved by faith through grace. That not of himself. It was imputed righteousness. You need the patterns of the Old Testament. God did something in the Old Testament here, and I want to show you that there is an army. Listen, we're going to be looking for this. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to show you an army in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I don't know why I can't find 1 Corinthians this morning. I have the right Bible version. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to show you an army. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to show you an army. And what I want you to look for is I want, to, I want you to see the army. I want you to see the task. And I want you to see the holy hand of God stripping the power away from the army. I want you to see 32,000 32, sitting in a missions conference going, we're going, we're going, we're going. Boy, we're going. And then I want you to see that 32,000 come Monday morning going, Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, I know what I said I was going to do. Lord, I don't know if I can do it now. I want you to see an army that is so motivated, and I want to see you uh, grasp the fact that, that God laid a task on this army, and as they're holding that task, they're saying, I'm not worthy. I have no power. I have no wisdom. I have no understanding. Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Until you just have 300 left going. <laughs> 50 to 1. 50 to 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified. That's a we. It's not a me. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Watch God strip all the strength away. Verse 25. But the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God. <laughs> but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why would God purposely elevate weak and broken people to the ministry? You say, I can't serve God. I'm broken. I'm not wise. I'm not mighty, I'm not noble, I have a stutter, I have a this, I have a that. And God says, hmm. church, this morning I'm broken, I'm unwise, I'm not noble, I'm weak, I'm despised, I have a vile past, I have ungodly habits that I lay on my face and I say, Lord, God, help me. I have a holy ministry I have, a, I have a work that has been laid in front of me. Lord, I can't. But he called me. Surely God could use a powerful speaker, but instead he wants to use this dog. I'm one of the 300. Why? Why would God want me? Because there's no way I can do it on my own. No way I can do it on my own. Why does God want to use you? Because there's no way you can do this on your own. God is sure to get the glory if there's anything that good that comes out of my life. If any good thing happens because of Jimmy Jackson in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, God will get the glory, not me. 
You say, well, you're putting on a, on a pretty good show. <laughs> Catch me when I'm hungry. <laughs> Catch me when I'm down. Catch me when I have my doubts. Catch me when Satan gets a really good hold and I'm struggling. Catch me then. You're like, we wouldn't like you then. <laughs> and I wouldn't like you either. <laughs> but Jesus Christ knows me and he loves me. Listen, it's, 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 this isn't just my opinion. Look at verse 29. Let's, let's let the Bible give us our theology. Let's let, let's let God teach us. Verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. He's our wisdom. And righteousness. He's our righteousness. We are not our own righteousness. And sanctification. He is that for us. And redemption. That according as is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Tell me how amazing you are. Tell me how amazing you are. Tell me how much strength you have. Tell me how much God needs you in the ministry. And I'll tell you, you're not where you need to be. If you come up to me and say, brother, I can preach so well. I'm going to tell you, okay, well, you're the 32,000. Good. Like, you're right here. You're ready to fight. You're ready to go. But you've got some things that need to take place. When you get over here, and you're still ready to fight, but you feel so inadequate, now you're the 300. Now you're ready to go out. How often does your heart burn when a preacher preaches the word? Now, how often, how often, when you hear somebody else talk about the call to the ministry, I, I'm not talking full-time, I'm not talking this or that, I'm talking about serving Jesus Christ with no reservations. When you're presented with an opportunity to hand a tract to somebody, or to give them the gospel, or your, your, your default answer is just yes. How often does your heart burn? And you're waiting, you're waiting for some service, you're waiting for some thing for you to finally go, you know what, Lord, that's the day. How many times have we been called to battle and we don't step up and we just don't go? We just, we're just there and our heart aches in us and we read this in the, in the scriptures where their heart burned for a thing and they call it the call of God and we call it whatever we call it. Well, the Lord hasn't called me. He hasn't? Does your heart not burn within you? What is the call to ministry? Our old wicked flesh is going to rise up and is going to make excuses. Our spirit is willing. Our flesh is our flesh. That thing's never going to come in line. Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall save me from the body of this death? Paul got it. Paul said, My body is going to fight me the whole way. But I've been called. Church, you've been called this morning. Jesus says, You're, go with me to 2 Corinthians. You go there and wait for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Jesus says in Luke 10 verse 3. <laughs> I saw it on a shirt. I forgot whose shirt said it. But Luke 10 3 says, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs amongst wolves. Listen, Jesus Christ is setting up an army. He's setting up a 300. He's setting up 32,000 who needs to be brought down. To, they need to be stripped of their own uh, amazingness. And they need to be brought down to that 300. And you know what? He still doesn't send us out as, as mighty angels. He doesn't send us out as an as a, as a army of fierce soldiers. You know what he sends us out as? He sends us out as lambs. You ever been to a petting zoo? Or a farm? <laughs> Listen, we're not called to be absolutely vicious. <laughs> you know, if I was going to war, I would not want to go with a lamb. Huh. I'd want to go with somebody whose hands were just stained in blood and like this, this massive beast of a person. Like I, I would want to go with just a, a scary individual. But you know what Jesus Christ does? Jesus Christ looks at hell and says, I'm preparing an army. And my army's going to come after you. And he goes over here and he prepares a whole bunch of little sheep. And he's so gentle to his sheep. And he's like, oh, here, let me go. All right, that's your task. You go that way. And as we go, how does it happen with Gideon? They walk around. They walk around the city playing an instrument. 
So these sheep start charging hell. Listen, if a whole bunch of sheep were charging hell, they'd probably have their ears like flapping, and they'd probably have a smile on their face. And the the soldiers of hell just crumble. Why? Was it because of the viciousness of the lambs? Is it because the the prison was so scary? (laughs) Or because the Holy Spirit of God was doing a work? And everybody looked and said, Oh, look how mighty those sheep are. They would go, Huh? (laughs) What power is behind them? That guy is not powerful. That lady isn't mighty. She was giving me the gospel presentation, and she was stuttering. I know who she is. When she's hungry, she's got a bad attitude. Like, I know her. Like, like we're sent after the, we're sent toward the gates of hell. What did one man say with a squirt gun? And the Holy Spirit of God is doing all the work. And when anybody looks at our work, they don't look at the lambs and say how powerful the lambs are. They go, Boy, they have a mighty God. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, like before, here's our final text. God puts a valuable thing in the hands of a broken army. He strips all the strength away so that only he can get the glory. We're going to end right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because that food smells so good. Verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. We're looking for the army. We're looking for the task. And we're going to watch God strip the strength away because that's his pattern. That's what he does. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, not me, we, we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Don't, don't, don't miss it. This is everything. This is the whole message. But we have this treasure. What treasure, church? The gospel. We have the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the perfect message from a perfect God that can save our soul. We have it. We have it. But do you know what we're holding on to this Bible with? Do you know what we walk around with the gospel message with? Earthly vessels. What's an earthly vessel? It's a clay pot. Anybody ever seen a flower in a clay pot? Like those, those, those little brown clay pots? The ones that you sneeze on and they break. I don't know why. I don't know who came up with it. I don't know whose great idea it was. If you invented the clay pot here in Perryville, I'm so sorry to offend you, but it's dumb. I'm going to put something really valuable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this beautiful flower that I'm going to put like an ice cube in because I can't water it with a lot of water and it just, like I might you know, hurt the flower. And I'm going to put this gorgeous thing that I put all this work in, and I'm going to put it in a clay pot. And if a two-year-old walks by it too fast, the the pot breaks. Why didn't God put the gospel in something else? God put the truth that can save the souls of men or cast them into hell in weak pots made out of dirt. I don't have to tell you this, we're made out of dirt, right? Adam means red-brown, okay, right? The Bible says we're going to return to dust. Why did God put something so priceless in the hands of people so feeble? Here's my last verse, verse 7. Read it for yourself. But we have this treasure, you and I have this treasure, the gospel treasure, in earthen vessels, clay pots. Why? Here's the lesson hidden right in the text that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So when the world sees just how weak the pot is, when the world sees how many cracks the pot has in it, you say, well, I'm a failure. Join the club. Don't give up. Step to the line. See how worthless you are and how amazing the gospel is. And get back in the fight. How long are you going to sit on the sidelines? Well, I lost, my, I lost my temper this morning. 
I sin this afternoon. Repent. Repent. And get back in the fight. The Lord didn't call cast iron skillets to the battle. If I went to battle, I would not want to go with the clay pot. <laughs> I mean, it looks nice. Like, it makes a sound as it bursts. Like, I want to go with the clay pot. I could kill a brother with a clay pot or with a cast iron skillet. Whew. But a clay pot? I'm going to hit you once. It's going to go to pieces. And then you're going to look on the ground. You're going to see all the pieces and go, man, they're a mess. Yeah. We have this treasure. It's truly a treasure. God wants broken and shattered people busy telling other broken and shattered pieces how good God is. A whole bunch of floppy-eared lambs running off to a battle that they can't win going, our God is good and he sent us this way and we're coming. Squirt, squirt, squirt. <laughs> and hell is falling down around us because God's good. God has a recipe for failure in the Christian life. Failure has a purpose. Why? It's so only God can get the glory. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I did my best. Lord, I beg that this church would see that they're clay pots, that they're broken, they're shattered. Some of us have more broken pieces than others. But Lord, you've taken the gospel ministry and you've put it down in those pots. And, and God, you want us pouring that out to this lost world. And, and when this lost world points back and they see our failures, Lord, help us not to point at ourselves and, and our strength or our perfection, our skills. But God, help us to point back to the shepherd. God, help us point back to the perfect God who gave us the ministry. God, help us get back in the fight. God, many of us have benched ourselves. We've put ourselves on the sidelines. We've, we've held off doing what we need to do. Help us repent. And God, help us never to put ourselves on the sidelines ever again. Help us be busy about the gospel ministry. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.